Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Navigating the Waters of Post-Transplant Nutrition, How to Help Patients Stay Afloat. We're so glad that all of you could join us as we have a wonderful presentation in store for you today. My name is Deanna Fenton, and I'm the Program Manager for the Alliance. Now, we do have just a few logistical items to review before we begin today's presentation. For those of you who have never joined us on this webinar platform before, the chat feature is located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Now, we are recording this webinar, so we will not be opening the phone lines during today's presentation. That means that all questions must be submitted electronically using this chat feature. If you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation is complete, we'll have some time for our presenters to address as many of your questions as time allows. Now, registration is currently open for our next webinar entitled, Miss Signals, Navigating a Difficult Phone Conversation. That's coming your way on March 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our upcoming webinar entitled Successful Postoperative Pain Management Using an Opiate Sparing Regimen. That's coming your way on March 26th at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can register for all these webinars and more on our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for those of you who may be interested in continuing education credits, we are offering one step C credit and one nursing contact hour for today's webinar. Everyone listening in is entitled to claim these credits. If you're listening in a group, as many of you are, please make sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. It's a very brief online evaluation which will allow you to receive your credit. As a reminder, for nursing, you have 14 days to claim your credit, and for Step C, you have 30 calendar days. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Melinda Fox, uh, Transplant Administrator at University of Kentucky. Melinda, thank you so much for joining us today, and at this point, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. We're very happy to have two transplant dietitians with us today to share their experiences and expertise. Megan Hansen is a registered dietitian at the Erlanger Kidney Transplant Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In her current role, she provides comprehensive nutrition therapy to pre-transplant recipients, living donors, and post-transplant patients. We also have Madison Hilgendorf. She's a registered dietitian and board-certified specialist in oncology nutrition. She completed her Master's of Science in Nutrition and Food Systems and is currently working as a clinical dietitian at the University of Kentucky, specializing in the liver and kidney transplant population. I'm going to go ahead and hand off to Madison, who's going to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Melinda. Our objectives today are to identify common post-transplant nutrition issues and potential barriers. We are going to list ways to bridge the gap between patients and the medical team regarding nutrition. We're going to explain how two different transplant centers structure their post-transplant nutrition programs, and we're going to describe strategies that can be used to improve overall post-transplant nutrition. Before we even get started talking about post-transplant nutrition, we need to discuss the role of the RD in transplant patients. CMS provided guidelines of when pa uh, patients are to be seen by the RD or the registered dietitian throughout their transplant evaluation. Also, they need to be seen within 48 hours after their transplant and then 48 hours prior to their discharge. And they also are to complete an education prior to their discharge from their hospital stay. As you can see, the CMS guidelines are very vague and can be interpreted and handled differently between centers. In the evaluation phase, an assessment can be completed via phone or in person, depending on the center's protocols. CMS does not mandate what the end assessment entails, but just that it must be completed prior to listing for transplant. Before even discussing the post-transplant side, we need to discuss our goals prior to transplant since pre-transplant nutrition can greatly affect their post-transplant status. Our goal as the RD is to make the patient as nutritionally sound for transplant, and we do this by setting nutrition goals. We want to maximize pre-transplant nutritional status. We want to manage symptoms of the disease process and maximize quality of life. We also want to promote weight gain in the underweight patient, especially since malnutrition prior to transplant can promote um, malnutrition and infection, wound healing issues, length of stay, and re issues after their transplant. 
and for the, those that are overweight or obese, we want to maximize weight loss prior to their transplant. And this will help with post-transplant weight gain and any hyperglycemia from some of their trans transplant meds. We also want to optimize glucose control and nutrient intake prior to transplant, and this can help have adequate glucose control after. And with their nutrient intake, we want to help them with any nutrient restrictions they may have. With their on dialysis, they may need to watch their sodium, their potassium, or their phosphorus. And then also help with symptom management of certain disease states like cirrhosis or heart failure needing sodium restrictions or fluid restrictions and with uh, the renal restrictions with dialysis. We also want to provide nutrition education as appropriate and really helping them with any issues or concerns with their condition and not understanding their nutrition restrictions or barriers. We also want to reinforce any education that has been delivered and help with any interventions. Moving into the acute phase, I'm going to discuss the acute phase after their post-transplant, and Megan will discuss the long-term post-transplant nutrition. We want to set goals after their transplant. Um, the biggest goals are to establish a mode of nutrition. We want to look at how quickly they're going to be able to have nutrition started, whether that be they need enteral nutrition, they need TPN, or they can be started on a diet. And this is dependent on which organ is transplanted, their GI function or their gastrointestinal function, their ability to eat, are they on the vent for an extended period of time, how is their appetite. We also want to look at if there's presence of malnutrition at time of transplant and what their needs might be. We also want to replete any nutrient stores that may be deficient. We want to minimize the nutrition-related side effects of their immunosuppressants. And we also want to provide adequate nutrition to support the body's ability to fight infection. They have increased needs after their transplant, and they can't properly fight off infection if they're not meeting these needs. We also want to increase our calorie and our protein intake to help heal anastomosis and surgical wounds. And we also want to supply adequate calories to help patients with their daily living activities or any physical rehabilitation they're getting within their hospital stay. Once a patient is transplanted, we have to complete a nutrition assessment. And there's many things we need to look at when completing this assessment to make sure we're setting up the right goals and right plan for this patient. The first one is looking if there's malnutrition at time of transplant. We can use multiple tools to assess the degree of malnutrition. We currently at the University of Kentucky use the nutrition focused physical exam, and this is looking at their muscle stores, their fat stores, how their weight history is, how their um, intake by mouth was prior to coming in, and just looking at their malnutrition status as an overall picture. And this can greatly affect what our plan could be. If they're already malnourished coming in to transplant, we might want to uh, be more aggressive with their nutrition, placing a feeding tube as soon as they're transplanted and starting that early interal nutrition. Or if a patient is not eating well, we might want to suggest a feeding tube earlier rather than giving them a few days to hopefully get their appetite improved. We also want to look at their lab values. Do they have any electrolyte abnormalities after their transplant? What does their potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, or sodium look like? Um, we also want to look at that as far as any diet restrictions. If they're having poor appetite, we may not want to restrict their uh, nutrients in their diet, but also if they're, they need it because they're AKI or have a kidney injury, and this is messing with their care. Glucose levels can also be elevated after their transplant because of the stress on the body and the medications we have them on. We also want to look at their nutrition history prior to admission. Do they have any diet restrictions coming in? Were they on any oral nutrition supplements? How was their PO intake or their intake by mouth prior to transplant? And if a patient is unable to be interviewed, definitely try to question the family and, and get an accurate nutrition history. We also want to look at any GI symptoms or gastrointestinal symptoms that they may have. Many of the medications we have them on after transplant can lead to diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. It can cause early satiety or gastroparesis, and this can affect their appetite, their PO intake, and any of their diet tolerance. We want to look at the mode of nutrition established. 
do we have a feeding tube in? Are they going to need TPN because they need bowel rest? Are they able to eat a diet? Are they at risk for having swallowing issues and maybe need to have a swallow eval to have them on the appropriate diet? Then looking at edema and cites, are they fluid overloaded? Should we put them on a fluid restriction? Do they need a sodium restriction? And is this ascites or edema affecting their PO take? If their ascites is large, that could be pressing on their abdomen and potentially limiting their PO intake at that time. We also want to look at their immunosuppression. Which drugs are they on and how can this affect their nutrition status? Many of the, the immunosuppressants can have issues with nausea or diarrhea and that could limit their PO intake. Are they on any dialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy? This causes changes in their proteins and their electrolyte management. We need, may need to put them on any diet restrictions or potentially change their tube feeding formula. We also want to look at if there's any vitamin or mineral deficiencies on time of transplant. Many cirrhosis patients have zinc deficiencies and this can mess with their taste buds or their appetite. And we definitely want to correct that as soon as possible. Dialysis patients tend to have anemia coming in too, and we want to make sure that they're on the right vitamin regimen to help with this. And CF patients or cystic fibrosis patients could also have fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, and we want to make sure they're on the correct vitamin regimen after their transplant. And then lastly, we want to look at their skin integrity. Do they have any wounds at time of transplant, and what is their risk of skin breakdown? Are they having any um, incontinence or having issues with mobility, and this is going to increase their risk. We also want to make sure we're adjusting their diet to make sure they're getting enough protein to reduce their risk of skin breakdown. There's many nutrition alterations in the acute phase. Nitrogen losses are increased, and so is protein catabolism, and this is mainly due to the corticosteroids that they're on and the stress that their body's undergoing. And in that shift, protein and carbohydrates become the preferred fuel source after transplant. So we, we definitely want to work on increasing our protein intake and correcting those nitrogen losses. The medications we have them on can also cause hyperglycemia and insulin resistance, and the stress of the body on this, with the surgery and any infection could also be causing hyperglycemia. The metabolic stress and the medications can also increase their metabolic rate, and we need to make sure that we're working on changing their needs based on this. The medical nutrition therapy for this patient population is higher than the general surgical population, and that's due to the increased catabolism and increased nitrogen losses in these patients. Generally, we recommend 30 to 35 kcal per kilogram or calories per kilogram, and if you have the ability to do indirect calimetry, that's always ideal because we're going to get a more accurate snapshot of their energy expenditure at that time. You can also go by the 130 to 150% of their basal energy expenditure or using the Harris-Benedict formula. We also want to have increased protein, and generally the recommendations are 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram. You want to adjust this based on any wounds that they might have, if they're on any re renal replacement therapy, drains, and any other changes in their patient condition that can increase their protein needs. Some patients may need a carbohydrate-controlled diet because they're having hyperglycemia, and we want to look at that and make sure that we're not giving them too many carbohydrates and we are fueling their hyperglycemia even more. With their fluids, we generally recommend one milliliter per calorie, but you also want to adjust this if they have any drains, whatever their urine output is, if they have wounds, they have diarrhea, or they're fluid overloaded. If a patient is innovated or critically ill, we want to use the Aspen guidelines first, but you always want to use your clinical judgment because sometimes the Aspen guidelines are not enough for what this patient is, has going on with them. And that's why our intense nutrition assessment is needed so that we can use our judgment and adjust our needs as, as we see fit. Micronutrients in the acute phase needs also change. For sodium, we want to have less than four grams per day, but we definitely want to adjust this if there's any issues with hypertension or edema. 
With calcium, we recommend 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day and looking at our calcium levels and making sure that they don't need supplementation. And many patients have been on a, a dairy restriction because of their phosphorus or potassium prior to their transplant, so making sure that those patients are addressed with their calcium and vitamin D and making sure they don't need to be supplemented. Potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium, we need to pay close attention to that, and that is definitely individualized per the patient. Some patients may need to be restricted with these micronutrients, whereas others need to be supplemented, and we need to look at their lab values and adjust it based on needed. Some patients may have a kidney transplant, but they're having delayed get graft function, so they might still be running high potassium and phosphorus levels and may need the restriction, versus others, their medications could be causing low levels of these, and we don't want to restrict it in their diet. And we should consider supplementing with a multivitamin post-transplant. This is to help prevent or correct any deficiencies that may be present. When we look at the immunosuppressants and nutrition, these are the most common immunosuppressant drugs that are being used by transplant centers out there. We have Prograf, we have Cyclosporin, Celset, Prednisone and Solumedrol, and Serolimus. And many of these have nutrition-related side effects, as you can see. Nausea, vomiting are very common with Prograf. Same with hyperkalemia, high glucose levels, and abdominal distress. There's also hyperkalemia, low magnesium, high hyperglycemia, and high lipid levels possible with cyclosporin. Diarrhea, nausea, vomiting with the cell depth. And then with prednisone and solumedrol, the number one issue that we typically run into is hyperglycemia. But long-term use of these drugs can lead to osteoporosis and impaired wound healing. And with the serolimus, there could be high triglycerides, high lipid levels, constipation, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea. And we need to look at the patient and see if these are the drugs in, or that are causing the diarrhea or abdominal issues versus there's something else going on, checking to make sure they don't have C. diff or that the, they're not getting enough fiber in their tube feeding or their diet's the cause. If you've eliminated all other aspects, maybe having their immunosuppression changed around to minimize nutrition-related side effects. The nutrition contra contraindications post-transplant um, for most patients, we recommend no grapefruit, grapefruit juice, pomegranate, or star fruit. Many of these have medication interactions. I always try to give the example of this with patients of this is not like eating an orange with a renal restriction. An orange is going to cause hyperkalemia. In this situation, these could potentially be blocking the, your medication from working the way they're supposed to. And really letting them know that this isn't just a, something they should limit, but it's something that they should keep out of their diet altogether. We also want to avoid using any immune enhancing products. There's not enough current evidence to support this use post-transplant, and where we're not really sure if this is safe for our patients, it should be something that should be avoided. Glutamine and arginine use post-transplant is also questionable, and research definitely is needed in this area before we can recommend it to patients. There's also a, re the research with probiotic supplements are mixed at this point in time. Probiotics have been helpful with having the correct gut, gut flora or helping with things like diarrhea, but in these patients, there's not enough research to show that they're safe and it possibly increases their risk for sepsis and infection. We also want to avoid herbal supplements because this may interfere with their immunosuppression or in some cases cause organ damage. And really talking to the patients about this, the safety issues with herbal supplements, how they're not FDA regulated, how we really don't know what they're getting if they take an herbal. I generally recommend patients let us know if they want to take an herbal supplement so that we can do a thorough look into the research and make sure that there's no contraindications for them and just really keeping that open dialogue with them. Um, now that I'm done talking about the acute phase, I'm going to hand it over to Megan and she's going to talk about long-term post-transplant nutrition. Thank you, Madison. Um, so adequate education is essential for the success of our transplant patients. Studies indicate that interventions that are in implemented at multiple times and for greater duration may be necessary to ensure behavior change. 
It should also be considered that sometimes it's difficult for patients that are hospitalized to internalize the material we're discussing with them, especially immediately following transplant. So I found it helpful to speak with patients on at least two separate occasions about their diet in their inpatient stay, as well as one visit as an outpatient within their first month post-op so I can really see um, how much information was absorbed and what they've started implementing. What you see before you is some of the education that I use um, in the hospital. These are two-sided, blown up to about placemat size, and laminated. And I found that these visuals and using the plate method has been really helpful in retention of information, especially in our patients that are very visual learners. So the diet that Madison reviewed in the acute phase is across the top there. Um, as you can see, emphasis on protein for that healing. Um, the biggest difference here and with our long-term diet after transplant is the protein needs um, then go down, leaving more space for the non-starchy vegetables. And when we're talking about the acute phase versus the chronic phase, the acute phase can last um, anywhere from one month to three months depended on, depending on the organ um, that was transplanted. The long-term diet post-transplant as far as the medical nutrition therapy um, is these are for um, patients with a functioning graft. So the calorie um, recommendations here are kind of a wide range, 23 to 35 calories per kilogram individualized to the patient. Protein is slightly elevated for long-term steroid use at 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram. Adequate fluid is essential, and it should be at least 2 to 3 liters per day. And our goal here is to avoid dehydration, and we've actually had some patients who are so used to following a fluid restriction before transplant that it's just one of their habits um, that needs to be broken because they could get hospitalized for dehydration, especially in the summer months. Magnesium and potassium may need restriction or repletion based on their lab value. Many times we see low magnesium after transplant. Vitamin D and phosphorus also are two nutrients that may need repletion after transplant, and um, patients seem to be um, kind of surprised by that low phosphorus, especially our kidney patients who were following low phosphorus diets. Now their phosphorus lab is low, and they need to eat foods that are higher in phosphorus. Sodium needs are about 2.4 grams per day, and the calcium needs are elevated at about um, 2,000 milligrams per day. And just a word about calcium supplementation. Calcium citrate is well absorbed. It doesn't generally cause constipation, and it can be taken on an empty stomach, whereas calcium carbonate may cause more issues with constipation and should be taken with food. But the drawback there is calcium citrate is generally more expensive. Some patients may um, have a gap in their nutrition and may need a multivitamin. And in that case, we really need to um, work with that patient and figure out what multivitamin they're taking or what we want to recommend. Um, some patients may be tempted to take gummy multivitamins, which tend to not have thiamine in them, um, or iron. So if that's something they need, then um, a different uh, multivitamin may be necessary. The following are the five um, biggest nutrition issues that we see in the long-term post-transplant patient, um, and next to them are some clinical goals um, to follow. So our general overall goal for our post-transplant patients are to improve the patient, graft, patient and graft survival, optimize their quality of life, and prevent and treat complications. So it's interesting to know that even with advances in medical care over the last 20 years, there's been little improvement over um, the long-term graft and patient survival. 
um, about 50% of our grafts uh, from deceased donors are lost in the first 10 to 12 years post-transplant for kidney. So this leaves growing interest in other factors that may influence outcomes like diet and lifestyle. So this is where a dietitian really may um, come into play and come in handy in the program. So I'll discuss each of these issues in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Obesity and weight gain is very common in the first year post-transplant, and it can be upwards of 10 kilograms in um, kidney patients. I like to call it the transplant 22. Um, weight gain can be multifactorial, so it can be caused by medications, increasing the appetite. Patients may be feeling better and have a better appetite in general, and they may be um, taking a little bit of advantage of um, less dietary restrictions. So obesity should really be looked at because it can be related to the development of other nutrition-related issues like heart disease and diabetes. At our clinic, we discuss weight gain and obesity risk related to transplants starting in the pre-transplant phase. And the hope here is that patients are able to make better health choices. And if weight loss is something recommended, they can focus on that. Um, and it will not only improve their health at that time on the wait list, but it may actually help their outcome after transplant. So really using that wait time um, to their advantage. So when discussing diet, um, in discussing um, weight management with a patient, the diet should be reviewed carefully. This includes um, discussing, discussing portion sizes, um, meal times, and limiting empty calorie foods. So these are foods that are maybe high in calories but not nutrient dense like sugar-sweetened beverages, sweets, alcohol, and liver transplant patients should not have any alcohol. Um, a variety of foods should be included. So um, I like to tell my patients, taste the rainbow, especially with your fruits and vegetables, um, but not the Skittles. We should be encouraging lean proteins, complex carbohydrates with adequate fiber, non-starchy vegetables, low-fat dairy, and fruit. Fiber can help fill them up, especially if their body is telling them they're hungry. We want to fill up on those foods um, that have good nutrients in them that may be lower in calories. We may also um, find it helpful to review mindful eating. So this basically means listening to the body for signs of fullness. Um, we need to eat when our bodies tell us to eat and not when our emotions do. And think of food as fuel and um, not something to be emotionally comforting. And avoiding multitasking while eating can be helpful as well. Exercise combined with diet can help produce a synergistic effect when it comes to weight management. Sleep and stress is not something that should be overlooked in our weight management as those can contribute um, to weight gain. Clinical depression within the first year um, after transplant can be common, and that depression can be associated with weight gain. The re patient's readiness to change should be reviewed, um, as the education recommendations and goal setting should take into account how much the patient is willing to change at that time. Uncontrolled diabetes after transplant can delay wound healing, increase, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, um, and other complications, increase the risk of infections, and also impact the graft and patient long-term survival. Um, some patients may already have pre-existing diabetes that needs to be managed. And in about one-third of our non-diabetic patients, um, they may have persistently high glucose metabolism six months post-transplant. So patients can actually develop new onset diabetes after transplant or no DAT. This is the greatest risk um, within the first three to six months post-transplant. Patients should be aware of this risk before transplant and counseled on diet, limiting sugars, um, portion control of carbohydrates, and um, education should be completed as needed. If a patient's A1C is less than 7, diet and lifestyle should be the first um, line of treatment. 
So diabetes can be managed with a well-balanced carbohydrate-controlled diet, as well as incorporating exercise, stress management, weight management, and adequate sleep. However, in some cases, oral medication or insulin may need to be started. And if insulin started, they may even need to see an endocrinologist to help manage that. Some patients, especially if they're new to diabetes, may benefit from a visit to a certified diabetes educator, either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or as part of a diabetes class. Some patients learn well in that type of setting. Heart disease is the leading cause of um, mortality in our kidney disease patients. Hyperlipidemia increases that risk of heart disease. It's estimated to occur in about 60 to 80% of our transplant patients. So transplant medications may be linked to hyperlipidemia, but lifestyle changes can still play a critical role in health improvement and helping with hyperlipidemia. So you he see here risk factors. The risk factors in bold are modifiable. So those are things that should be addressed to help control that, um, those labs. Patients still may require statins in some cases. Um, this goes with triglycerides as well. They may be very high in some patients after transplants, and diet and lifestyle should be looked at, especially because fibrates are not advisable with our um, chronic kidney disease patients. Hypertension is one of the most common post-op complications, affecting about 85% of recipients. The risk factors are similar to hyperlipidemia with the modifiable risk factors in bold. Recommendations here, optimizing weight, um, living an active lifestyle. Some patients um, are really interested in following a specific diet, want a name for a diet to follow. So in that case, I point them more to the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension or Mediterranean diet. So these diets emphasize portion control and they're plant-based. They encourage adequate fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean unprocessed protein, low-fat dairy, and healthy fats while limiting sugar and salt. Um, and medication may, also, may be needed in these patients. So bone health. For transplant patients, osteoporosis is usually caused by a variety of factors related to end-stage chronic disease, immunosuppressant medications, corticosteroids, and de decreased levels of physical activity. The greatest rate of bone loss after transplant is the first 6 to 12 months post-op. The incidence of osteoporosis has been reported to be as high as 40%. Um, depending on the type of organ transplanted. Lung and liver recipients have the highest incidence of osteoporosis-related fractures. A patient may need to be screened yearly with an annual DEXA scan to help evaluate bone density, as, long as, as well as routine vitamin D lab tests. Some nutrients of interest with bone health, um, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D. Um, just a word about calcium, yes, it's in dairy, but it's also in, uh, we don't want to forget about those leafy vegetables, broccoli, fish canned with the bones, beans, foods fortified with calcium, such as almond milk, uh, fortified almond milk. Osteoporosis is a silent disease, so it may not hurt until something breaks. Um, so many times it's hard to um, counsel patients on the importance of bone health, but this poster to the left here, um, from World Osteoporosis Day is something that we put right where we measure patients because so many of them, um, when we take their, their heights, we see a decrease in height. They say they're getting shorter or shrinking, and then we just kind of point to this sign, and it's something that we can um, incorporate um, with that discussion. It's also important to exercise. Um, exercise for bone health, even working on posture. We want to avoid smoking, excess alcohol, and also excess sodium intake. So food safety should be addressed um, in the hospital and followed up on 
just to make sure patients have a good understanding of food safety. So the transplant patient is at higher risk for developing a foodborne illness than the general population. They're more likely to be hospitalized and have a longer duration of the illness. There's transplant specific resources on the FDA website, um, but a brief overview of this would be avoiding high risk foods like sushi um, and raw sprouts, four steps to food safety, clean, so clean surfaces, well, hands well, good hand hygiene, separate, so avoiding cross contamination, cooking foods to the appropriate temperatures, and we include a, um, a chart in our education with each food and the temperature they should reach, and chill, so refrigerate and freezing properly. Um, the best phrase here is when in doubt, throw it out. If it looks strange, smells strange, you're not sure when it was put in there, just throw it out, it's not worth it. The USDA has put out a Food Keeper app and this app is great because it um, gives info on how to cook and store foods properly, and it's right there at the touch of your fingers. Um, it also has information about food recall, so you can actually set alerts that um, will come up on your phone when a new food recall comes out. It, additionally, it has educational videos as well. Exercise is something to be encouraged in patients that are able to do so just for overall health and um, four of those five nutrition issues I identified earlier. Clearance from the appropriate medical professional is necessary, but general recommendations are appropriate for most people. So a weekly, good weekly exercise goal includes 150 minutes of moderate activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity. This activity should it be well-rounded, incorporating endurance like walking, swimming, biking, strength, um, strength training, um, body weight exercises, and also flexibility. And if a patient starts to, if we start to see deconditioning, um, physical therapy may be needed to um, help with activities of daily living. So we always hope a patient will have smooth sailing after transplant, but unfortunately, sometimes they may encounter some rough waters. So during the chronic post-transplant phase, patients may have various nutrition-related issues, and some of these issues um, can affect their nutrition status by altering their needs um, and also altering their ability to meet their nutritional needs. So some patients may experience rejection, delayed graft function, acute kid kid kidney injury, all of which may alter their nutrition requirements. They may um, acquire an infection and require hospitalization. They may experience GI upset because of a medication intolerance. Um, they may have excessive diarrhea. Um, any of these issues can cause a decrease in nutrition intake and lead to malnutrition. Some patients may need a vitamin or mineral supplementation. They may need their diet altered. They may need an oral protein calorie supplement to provide additional um, nutrients that they may be losing out on. Um, and in some cases, they may need nutrition support like tube feeding. Some patients may experience malabsorption, and I put bariatric patients here because I just wanted to touch base on that. Some patients may turn towards bariatric surgery to meet BMI criteria to get on the transplant list. And with an alteration in GI anatomy, that can affect the absorption of nutrients. So it's very important to be aware of which, nutri which nutrients those are. And in the recent December issue of the support line peer-reviewed publication of the DGP, Dietitians uh, in Nutrition Support, they published a practical guide for the registered dietitian um, combining both bariatric surgery and transplant, so that can be very helpful um, as a guide to work with those patients. So we really want to bridge the gap between our patients um, 
and ourselves. So here are some um, keys to help with that. Communication is key. We want to build this relationship with our patients and get buy-in from patients. We're really on their team, um, and we have should have their best interests at heart. We want to problem solve together. We want to investigate what their barriers are and offer examples of how to overcome them. So this is where motivational in interviewing may come into play, um, especially when a patient is kind of ambivalent to making change. We want to goal set together and agree on goals together, something that will work for the patient um, and also help reach their goal. Um, we want to show them empathy and show that we're understanding where they're coming from and we want to meet, pa meet people where they are. We want to educate ourselves so we can educate the patient on best practices and we also want to be an advocate for our patients. So we are the voice of our patients, um, especially in team meetings. So um, whatever we believe is best for the patient is what we should kind of fight for them. Now we're going to talk about our individual post-transplant nutrition programs at the different facilities. At the University of Kentucky, we transplanted 200 in patients last year. We currently have four full-time transplant dietitians on staff. We cover all inpatient, outpatient, and pre- and post-transplant patients. We transplant liver, kidney, pancreas, heart, lung, and we also have a living donor kidney program. As far as our post-transplant inpatient care, a, a transplant dietitian follows all patients throughout their admission. We manage all their tube feedings, their diets, and any nutrition education these patients may need. We have daily interdisciplinary roundings where we sit down with social work, pharmacy, the surgeons, the residents, ICU team, nephrologists, and we really have a day-by-day -day care plan for each of our patients. And on that disciplinary rounds, the, I serve as the kind of nutrition champion for my patient, and I'm really their advocate in stressing what's going on with their diet on a daily basis. As far as after they've been discharged after their transplant and are readmitted, I just screen them and see them as needed. If they're coming in with poor appetite, malnutrition, or GI issues, I will typically see them. But if they're coming in for just routine things like infection, I just watch them with a close eye and step in as needed. In our clinic post-transplant, we currently just see patients as needed. We do not have a routine um, system in place of when we're seeing them. They're normally just screened by the dietitians, the nurse practitioners, the doctors, the nurses, and our um, PAs. And we will either see them in person or if we're un unable to see them because of our schedule, we'll follow up with them on the phone. And after that, there's no routine follow-up. Um, some patients will ask to see us again. If it's a one-stop issue, they just need a simple diet education, we normally don't follow up, versus if it's a long-term issue, we may have scheduled follow-ups with them. And then we are lucky to have a program here where we provide oral nutrition supplements at cost. So we're really good about um, screening those patients and helping them and making sure that that's not a barrier to them meeting their nutrition needs after transplant. We do have a couple programs that we are working on in the future just because we really did see a bridge in, or a gap in our care. So we are starting a malnutrition screening using the malnutrition screening tool and the subjective global assessment. We actually are going to have two different dietitians on staff, um, one of them being me, are, we're going to place feeding tubes in clinic. And we currently have dietitians that place them in the hospital, but we were having to readmit patients to place feeding tubes or sending them to the ER, and we just really realized that was not a good tool and a good part of our resources. We're also implementing a frailty screening tool, and then we are, have support groups in the process where we're going to be part of their post-transplant nutrition education. And now I'm going to hand it over to Megan to let her talk about her program. Okay, so I'm over at the Erlinger Kidney Transplant Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In 2018, we did 26 adult renal transplants. Um, two of those were with living donors. We have 159 patients on the wait list at present. And as far as dietitian coverage, it's half a full-time employee. So that's me, and I'm t about 20 hours a week. 
I cover all pre and post recipients, pre and post living donors, um, in both the inpatient and the outpatient setting. Currently, as far as post-transplant care, um, I've kind of shifted in the pre-transplant phase to focus on how we can improve outcomes um, before transplant even happens. Um, the majority of our new transplants are seen in the outpatient setting within one month post-transplant. And if a patient is readmitted to the hospital in the first six months of transplant, I will um, go ahead and assess that patient. If there are any issues in the post-transplant phase, the pharmacist, nurse, or doctor um, will alert me and I will see those patients as needed. I prefer to see patients in person, but sometimes that is not feasible, so I do um, over-the-phone consultations as well. We have a support group that our social worker has started um, that is monthly that really helps to not only um, strengthen relationships between um, patients that have gone through transplant, their relationships together, but also the transplant team and the patient. So in, the pro in progress and future post-transplant care, um, I would really love to see a post-transplant screening protocol, including um, screening for significant weight gain or loss, uncontrolled or new diabetes, altered nutrition-related labs, um, and also possibly frailty score decline. We're also looking into insurance reimbursement for our post-transplant visits and to see if that is feasible for our program. So here are some tips on how to Im improve the overall transplant nutrition program. So first is supporting the patient. So we want to optimize the patient's health in the pre-transplant phase. We want to identify any gaps in care and find solutions for improvement. Um, support groups can be really great in helping that patient feel, um, for lack of a better word, supported. Um, also identifying reliable resources and there was a recent exploratory correlational study that showed that the use of a mobile health app may have a relationship with decrease in hospitalizations um, in the post-transplant phase. So that's very exciting. So um, recommending resources that work for patients. As professionals, we want to continue to build our professional network so that could be within a transplant team, um, as well as inpatient staff providing education as needed. Partnering as a dietitian, partnering with other local dietitians can be helpful, especially those in um, the dialysis clinics, the bariatric clinics. Um, that way you can really pull on their expertise if you need that. There are a few listservs that um, you can join as a professional, um, renal, as well as a new transplant Google listserv. Um, there's also a transplant nutrition transplant group on LinkedIn, and um, a great networking opportunity is the NatCo Transplant Nutrition Conference. Um, in addition to networking, you also get kind of the cusp of, of the research there. In summary, CMS requires dietitian involvement in all three phases of transplant. The overall nutrition goals for transplant recipients are to maximize nutritional status pre- and post-transplant. We want to manage any disease symptoms they may be having. We want to maximize their quality of life and provide nutrition education as appropriate. Transplant recipients have various nutrition-related issues. They require very different diet restrictions, and they need education on healthy eating pre- and post-transplant. Nutrition needs vary based on acute versus chronic post-transplant, and post-transplant patients are at an increased risk for various comorbid conditions. Healthcare practitioners play a critical role in the success of our patients and their post-transplant care. Our objectives today that we met were to identify common post-transplant nutrition issues and any potential barriers, list ways to bridge the gap between patients and the medical team regarding nutrition, explain how two different new transplant 
programs structure their post-transplant nutrition programs, and then describe strategies that can be used to improve overall post-transplant nutrition. And here is our, some of our references. All right, well, thank you, Megan and Madison, for such a wonderful, informative presentation. Um, before we head into the Q&A session, I'd just like to remind uh, everyone that if you do have any questions for our presenters, please be sure to submit them um, using our chat feature. Again, that's located at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Also, during the Q&A session, I will have this poll up. So for those of you who are listening in a group, if you could please complete this poll just to let us know how many people are actually participating in your group, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and at this point, I'll turn it back to Melinda uh, to moderate your questions. Thank you. Melinda, your phone might be muted because we can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry about that. The first question is, can you repeat how to access the guide for malabsorption again? I'm thinking is that, I'm guessing that's related to the bariatric and um, transplant guide. Um, that's in the December 2018 um, edition of um, support line, which is the Dietitians and Nutrition Support um, Practice Group. So I believe you would have to be a member of that practice group to get access to that or if you know someone, but it's in the 2018 December edition. Great. And the next question is, what kind of nutrition supplements do you provide at cost to patients and is this provided in the clinic? We currently set them up with a prescription um, by the providers and they take it to the pharmacy. Both the pharmacy and the hospital and in our clinic have their supplements stocked and we have them just the basic, um, we also have glucose control f um, formulas and then those that are low in electrolytes and just based on what they need, we write them a script for it and we sell it to them for what we buy as a facility. And I know that there's other facilities that do this and you you can do it for different companies. It just depends on which company your hospital or your facility is affiliated with. Next question is, can you elaborate a little more about your frailty screening tool? Sure. Um, we use the Johns Hopkins um, Freed Frailty Tool Calculator. Um, this includes five um, areas of measurement. So this is um, weight loss um, within the past year, um, self-reported exhaustion, hand grip um, strength using a hand grip um, test, uh, walk test, walking speed test, um, which is four meters long, and the final is a physical um, activity assessment questionnaire. Um, we use the the Johns Hopkins online tool because it is easy and as they say it takes the guesswork out of that, um, out of measuring how much each, um, each uh, category, how many points that's worth, um, which categories, how frail a patient is. So in the pre-transplant setting this can be really helpful in determining um, who's the most important, uh, who's the most appropriate um, to be listed, who's going to do well, um, more likely based on frailty. Um, what I've found interesting about frailty is there was a recent article in the Journal of Renal Nutrition, um, and it was put out on Valentine's Day, but the, that frailty can be associated in changes in cognitive function after transplant as well. So um, there's going to be more on frailty, I'm sure, but um, we've implemented on the pre side and it would be really interesting to see on the post side um, where we can go with this frailty assessment tool. Another question is, can you let us know your reference for the 2,000 milligram calcium intake post-transplant? 
Sure. That was in the Chronic Kidney Disease and Nutrition Care Process put out by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So it's a pocket guide, um, and that is, um, is the reference for that. And then in order to get reimbursement of clinic visits, are you having the social workers manage this program? Um, we I don't think either. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say I don't think either of us are doing it. That's just something we want to do in the long term. Gotcha. Future future plan. Yeah. So CMS um, will will reimburse um, within the first three years. A certain amount um, is allowed to be billable per year um, if the dietitian has a current Medicare provider number and a doctor order. Great. Um, another question is, how do you make sure you see the patient within 48 hours of discharge? At our facility where we have daily rounds, that's our biggest way we figure out who's leaving. Um, our providers are really good about saying, hey, this person's going home today and they're, because they're part of their discharge planning. And then we always on a Friday make sure we ask who would be going home over the weekend so we can make sure that we are educating them and having their notes in before discharge. Another question is, do you address well water as a potential source of bacterial contamination? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know our social workers. Partner. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then this is a question specifically for Madison. It says, do you see all of the pre-transplant patients, or is that a screening process as well? We currently see every single patient as part of their pre-transplant evaluation. If they're unable to see us um, before their transplant, we will do a phone consult, and that's typically only in the kidney patient population that will do that, but any high-risk populations like lung, liver, um, heart, we typically always make sure we have a one-on-one -on -one evaluation with them at least once prior to their transplant. Do either of your programs refer patients for bariatric surgery pre-transplant, and if so, what is the most common surgical procedure? Um, we have referred patients to bariatric surgery um, over a certain body mass index. Um, what we found that's kind of interesting um, recently, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee has said that they're no longer covering end-stage organ diseases or transplant candidates. Um, so I'm not sure how this has caught on to other insurance companies, but it is something to kind of keep in the back of our minds that this could be um, something to catch on. Um, and the patients that I've managed from the transplant side um, was a ruid why. We also refer patients for bariatric surgery, but we only refer them if they have a BMI greater than 40 or um, if they're they're failing any like weight loss education or weight loss management, and we typically only let them do the gastric sleeve, and Ruin Y is, is normally not our preferred surgical option. One of the last questions is how do you join the Google Transplant Listserv? Do you know Madison? Um, well, I do, there's, they set it up through the um, LinkedIn, and there is a moderator who can send out the link, and you join through Google. You have to have a Google account um, to, to access it, but you can have it sent to like your – I have it through my work email that I get all the, the emails, but I, to directly access the group, you have to have it through Google. And I know you can search it under Google Groups, um, Transplant Nutrition, and request to be added to it. And I think we had a few questions about if the handouts are going to be available. Yes. Uh, so for all participants, just so you know, following uh, the conclusion of today's presentation and webinar, we will send out the PowerPoint handout to all participants. Thank you. And
And hopefully we have time for one more that just came in. It says, I know probiotic supplements are not recommended, but are probiotic foods okay post-transplant? I always tell patients that it's fine as long as they're um, a commercially processed probiotic food, so yogurt or fermented foods, but we definitely encourage them to not have like homemade fermented foods like kimchi um, because there could be a possible source of um, bacteria in there that can make them sick. We're right at four, and I think we've answered all our questions. Looks to be true. Yes. Uh, oh, no, that's just a comment saying thank you so much. Um, so on behalf of the Alliance, I'd just like to extend our sincere thanks um, to both speakers, Megan and Madison, as well as Melinda, for your time and for sharing your expertise on this topic. And to all of our participants, I'd like to thank you for your time, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your week. Take care.